Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark. We get to talk Hello. to the people that are designing the future of the world. Things are going to change, guys. Newsflash. A lot of things are changing. <laughs> Technology drives changing. And uh, we explore and unpack what that means to us, what that means to culture, families, all of that fun stuff. Um, so today I want to, I want to just kick off a few ideas, Mark, for, for this conversation. Go it's quantum it. season. I'm, I'm so excited about quantum season. We had our first episode last week. We're, we're continuing the conversation this week. And as a reminder, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum physics is counter to how we experience the world. Just a reminder for those listening, in case you missed yesterday, we're going to kind of tease this in and, and it's not really supposed to make sense. Like Einstein called it spooky, ac spooky action. It freaked him out. Like it, it was like, he didn't know what to do with it. And, you know, there were things about uh, talking about things moving faster than the speed of light that he was like, no, this can't be possible. Well, they ended up figuring out quantum mechanics is real equations, prove it, all of that fun stuff. But it's really interesting to think about quantum, like the small pieces of the, uh, that operate the world that operates more like nature. Like rather than this controlled thing, like when humans get control of stuff, we like to organize it, right? So like traditional computing is organized into ones and zeros, right? Quantum computing does things a little bit different, which we'll explore, but it's also important to have that bridge to how we do things, which Jason's going to get into today, how we're kind of merging classical compute and quantum compute, which is super exciting. Um, well, that's one of the things we've kind of learned already in quantum season, that there is no one quantum computing. It, there's different facets to this. And I think today, and I might be wrong, but I think we're going to be exploring that kind of zone where classical computing and quantum computing merge. And we're talking about the scale, scalability, scaling quantum computing, that useful quantum computing that everybody can access. And I, yeah, I think that involves maybe that that point where the two technologies merge. And uh, P.S., if you want to dive in a little bit deeper into quantum with us, uh, new book club book announcement. It's out. Michio Kaku's new book, Quantum Supremacy. I'm so, so looking forward to reading this book. This He's been one of my favorite uh, people to listen to. I saw him at a conference years ago and he talked about the we'll have the ability in the future. We don't need spaceships. We need the ability to beam our consciousness between stations across the universe. And he had me at that. So I can't wait to jump in. Mark, uh, let's intro our guests and let's dive into this stuff. Yeah. Our guest today, Jason Lynch, he is the CEO of Equal One and he is on a mission to bring quantum computing to, to the world. So welcome to the show, Jason. Pleasure. Thank you for being here. Gentlemen, uh, delighted to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're excited. So, um, Jason, as you know, we we like to string these episodes together. We we talked to uh, we had another quantum guest on last week that uh, that left a question for you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kick off with that question, and we'll we'll dive right into that, and then go into some other things. Yeah, shout out to Joe Fitz Simons, who I think maybe your and his past have crossed. His question mm -hmm. for you was, um. What are the applications of quantum computing we haven't thought of? Or what, what is going to be um, the surprising outcome of this that nobody's speaking about? Yeah, so I think what comes to mind here is maybe um, a quote by Richard Feynman, right? So Richard Feynman, um, one of the legends of uh, physics in general, but also quantum physics, and he did a lecture in 1959 that was titled there's plenty of room at the bottom right and the whole lecture was around nanoelectronics and at that stage you know transistors were just coming out and i you know one uh, hunch i have maybe that uh, we could use quantum computers for that ha we haven't talked a whole lot about is the next level down right the quarks and these other things that you know we're we're uh, trying to put experiments in, in uh, CERN and other places today to figure out are, are they real and how does that world look like? And so if I think about the most powerful computers today, some of the things we're trying to do on them is figure out that next level down. And I think quantum computers can help us learn more about the world that's below electrons and, and, and go to quarks and these other subatomic particles. 
Jason, you had me at Richard Feynman. He's one of my favorites. Like I, you know, surely you must be joking. Richard Feynman was like the the rabbit hole book for me a long time ago, and and that particular talk is is brilliant. And the root of nanotech, uh, largely. Um, I love that. Yeah, and 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 I think it applies now more than ever, right? I my I, I think we have a tendency as a, a species to think we've most of this uh solved right i think we have only a tiny tiny percentage of this solved and there are so many uh challenges both you know uh lower in scale and uh and so yeah i think this is a there this is a, quantum computing is going to be a massive tool to help us understand more about our world um and i think that's one of the reasons why it's so exciting yeah um as if I, I, I have to tell the audience watching this that um, we haven't spoken about Richard Feynman before the show. So Jason has brought up Richard Feynman and me and Jeremy were just talking about Richard Feynman before the show. And oh, well. we were actually <laughs> planning to try something new on Thinking on Paper today, like a new segment, a new section called Explain It Like You're Richard Feynman. <laughs> um, unbelievably, because going through the Equal One website, and doing the quantum season there's a lot of terminology there's a lot of vocabulary which mm. if you're not in this can seem daunting scary or just completely incomprehensible mm -hmm. um so i've taken a few of those words from the website and could you explain them like you're richard Feynman, jason if i i'll read try my to best you? I, I love it's amazing mark before we do that let's let's just so listeners check this out like so traditional like computing right you have one or zero you know that's it it could be on or off one or zero and you know the the way kind of like the qubit thing is or at least how i get my head around it is there's an infinite spectrum of identity between one and zero that quantum allows us to do so this whole like infinite possibility of compute paths is at least at least how i get my head around this thing um is uh is it, just trying to set the stage for that but let's go in the terminology okay um, am i still here because i think my internet yes. just dropped out yeah you're there okay great so quantum system on chip qsoc yes so uh, basically, our our approach. I mean, Equal One was formed uh, basically with the thesis that uh, all of computing has advanced with silicon and with CMOS and with uh, the semiconductor industry that we have built. Um, and our belief is scalable quantum will uh, take the same path. So you know, time and time again, people questioned Moore's law. People question, could we do certain things in semiconductors? And we've come up with the answer every time that we can. If it's, you know, whether it's from 4G, 5G, now 6G, whether it's autonomous driving, all of this has advanced along with computing, um, along with the advancement of silicon. And so our sort of starting thesis is that, and our, our thesis is that we should build on the shoulders of, of what we have today and not start this uh, start again and so what quantum system on chip means and anybody in the classical technology semiconductor industry will know what system on chip means it means that you put as much on a chip as possible and you integrate you know as much as possible uh, onto the chip to enable massive functionality and we again think this uh, same approach uh, should be taken in quantum and, and is what is going to lead us to scalable quantum so when we talk about quantum system on chip we're referring to a chip uh, that has the qubits it has uh, all of the control electronics that you need to talk to the qubits but it also has you know the mo the, the latest and greatest cutting edge uh, ARM processors, um, you know, all uh, tensor processors, so that uh, right next to the qubits, we can do some of these algorithms that 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 people are talking about. So, so that's quantum system on chip. Awesome. Okay, got it. Got a follow up there. So, so you have you have quantum and classical like living in the same space, and they're two very different technologies. Does the classical side of that chip? act as this translator and allow you to use existing algorithms 
in a more efficient way r rather than completing completely having to reinvent the algorithm side? Um, in, in a way, I mean, one way to think about it is if you look at these quantum algorithms and the ones we're particularly focused on, and we can get into sort of more on the applications, but they're chemistry and optimization. And typically what you need to do in those is you have your quantum, your qubit array, and you make some um, controls on that qubit array, and then you read it out, and then you have to do quite a bit of classical uh, processing. So whether it's error correction or whether you're processing uh, to see, you know, have you gotten the, the optimum result, there is a significant amount of classical processing done in a quantum algorithm. And so our belief is that's sort of not really discussed today. But when we go to massive, you know, if you look at these uh, chemistry systems that we want to simulate, we need, you know, thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of qubits. There's going to be massive control needed for that. And so it's really about, you know, if you look in, in under the hood in these, uh, in these quantum algorithms, there is in a lot of them quite a bit of classical that goes hand in hand. Okay. That makes if sense. And, and more about quantum software. Watch last week's show. That's that's right. And, and, and hey, curious minds out there, listen. Uh, so the idea you've probably seen what these quantum computers look like. It's a giant chandelier. It's gold. It's huge and big. But like the compute part of that is the tiny little black box sitting at the very bottom of it. Everything else is to control the environment that makes the qubits operate and work. So let's go, let's go to other terms, Mark, what else did you have on the, on the Richard Feynman hot list? Well, some of these um, might not be the right terminology, or you might have already said this, but um, unity Q qubits. And I guess, is that different to a, a qubit? Uh, well, so um, Unity Q is really our um, our brand around unifying classical and quantum, and it's really to try to drive that message home that you know qubits on their own, uh, you need we need to be able to talk to them, we need to be able to read them out, we need to be able to do you know classical processing around them. So Unity Q is really the brand uh, of um, of the system on chip. Uh, in terms of the qubits, I mean, th there's maybe something to say about those and, and how we're approaching it. So uh, you mentioned the chandelier. I mean, our um, and the reason you have a chandelier like that is because the particular qubits are superconducting. So there's, let's say, you know, a handful of um, technologies that are vying for, um, you know, the, the, a scalable qubit platform. Superconducting are extremely cold, 40 millikelvin, so point, you know, 0 0.04 degrees above absolute zero. They need to be cooled to to operate to operate. And the reason being, again, you know, for some context, these qubits are extremely sensitive, right? So we don't see quantum effects at room temperature because of the thermal noise and all the other things that are going on. So when we when we get these qubits into a quantum state we need to make the environment extremely pure and we need to reduce the, the noise as much as possible superconducting qubits need to be cooled down to 40 or uh, 50 millikelvin our qubits which we call spin qubits actually can operate at about a thousand times warmer than that so we're targeting ultimately about one kelvin now that's still extremely cold but what it does allow us to do is it enables the system on chip. So one of the challenges and one of the reasons you need the chandeliers are essentially the control electronics for the qubit. Because we can do them at one Kelvin, we have enough thermal budget on the chip to put them next to the qubit. And that again is sort of our um, differentiator and, and, uh, and our disruption where um, because we can operate these qubits somewhat warmer, we can we have more thermal budget available to do more things to control them. I'm gonna have to play my my silly card here and ask Absolutely. help he There's help no me cards. <laughs> help me understand more how you can be a thousand um, percentiles warmer or a thousand like how can mm -hmm. you do this? in such a warm, much more warmer environment than sure. traditional quantum computing is, leads me to believe. 
Sure. Uh, so for that, I'm going to go a little bit to the team and our and our experience and our background. So we're we're a, a bit of a different team than the standard quantum teams. I mean, typically, a quantum computing companies up to now are typically academic teams that come out from a university, and we have that. We have the academic prowess, and we have you know some of the best scientists in the world. But we also have some of the best technology commercialization um, people in the world, people who have done the first smartphone chips, um, you know, people who have done uh, AI accelerators that are on, um, you know, um, processors today for Intel. And what we've learned is that it's not really about perfecting one thing. It's about a system optimization. So from the very beginning, we're we're about five and a half years old. And from the very beginning, we took an approach that said, okay, ultimately the game here is not to make the best qubit and uh, you know, the best single qubit and uh, you know, try to improve on that. The game here is, is to make the best system and optimize the system such that we can actually get a, a quantum computer built. And so to answer your question, these will never be the best qubits, but we believe it's the sweet spot um, between qubit performance and being able to maintain the qubit in a quantum state for long enough, and also the other things that a system needs to be able to deliver scalable quantum. So when we talk about scalable quantum, that's really what we talk about. It's, it's about saying, okay, we may need to give up a little bit on the qubit performance, and this is not going to be the you know, ultimately the best raw qubit, but when you put it together with everything else, it ends up being the best system. And that's really a philosophy that we've, uh, you know, we've learned the hard way through um, these, you know, these products that, that the team has built over the last number of decades, that that's the way to, to bring technology to commercialization, that you can't just focus on one piece of this, this has to be a system optimization. So accessible quantum, accessible and applicable quantum then. Useful Absolutely. quantum as we've I mean, heard before. Yes, and, and again, I think one of the things I feel strongly about and the company feels strongly about is, um, you know, if you do look at these, uh, at, at um, typical quantum presentations, it is these massive machines, it is sort of big infrastructure, it is the impression that this is going to cost a lot and it's only going to be available for the richest of companies and the richest of countries. And I think that's a dangerous philosophy, right? I think quantum needs to be used to actually level the playing field rather than to, to you know, increase the gap between the, the haves and the have nots. And I think there is a sort of a, um, a view that this is extremely costly in the you know hundreds of millions or billions of dollars our company was formed on the basis that if we can get quantum working on these processes that have been that have given us ai and all of these other things then we can leverage the economics of that and we can bring quantum to the masses and again not have it just for uh, the richest companies and the richest countries so that's that's awesome that's dis that's disruption that's that's yeah you know, we always talk about the calcified systems that are operating the world and and some of those that need to be shaken loose a little bit and accessibility to technology is one of the bigger things and that's really cool that you guys are you guys are thinking about that so all right so let's say let's say mark and i run like a mid-sized uh i don't know like make it, make it exciting no Hel no, like a, oh. no 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 let's think about it. some kind of healthcare technology that could potentially benefit from the use of quantum computing so we've got a data center sitting in atlanta georgia it's got racks of computers you know you know, rack mount computers that's all operating we're doing some interesting things on the compute side but how how do you approach like a cto say mark's our cto how do you approach someone like them to kind of say hey you know, here's how you can transition what you're doing today into the quantum world. Absolutely. And actually, we're, we've been out um, talking to companies like that uh, for the last six months, and there's a massive amount of excitement. I mean, again, coming back to our philosophy, I think what we would say is we believe quantum should look, uh, you know, a lot like compute today. Um, we believe that we should be building on 
everything that we have. So the most powerful GPUs, the most powerful processors, we should leverage that and add the qubits on. And so, you know, our first machines are fully contained uh, rack mounted systems that are, you know, a meter high and will plug into your standard data center. You don't need any special environment. You don't need any special vibration. These things are like your the systems that you use today. Now they do contain a closed cycle cryo cooler and these are used uh, in MRI machines today, right? Uh, and, and I'm not sure um, it's widely known, but an MRI machine contains a system that cools the components to three Kelvin. So we leverage that and then we need to, we do need to get from three Kelvin to one Kelvin. So that's the bit that we add. But this is in an MRI machine today, a very contained, very reliable. It, we've had, you know, four of these machines running for the last two years in our own data centers which is what gives us the confidence to go out. So what I would say to you know, a, a CTO of a company that's interested is we're, we're, we have a roadmap that brings companies along the journey with us over the next few years. We have the benefit of you know, having a very um, economic uh, upgrade cycle. Again, you don't have to build a new building. You don't have to spend tens or hundreds of millions more we can very, because it's a chip, we can very easily upgrade you along that path. And you can have your engineers start to dabble, start to look at algorithms. And if it's sensitive, we can have it even in your own data center. That's that's awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay down this track a little bit. I'm a, I'm a data center nerd. I worked in data centers for a long time, doing transformation, doing migration, mm -hmm. DR, ops, all that kind of stuff. So like, so you, you have these rack mounted systems that can, that, that can fit into existing footprints. That's all great. How do you, cause I think one of the things that is confusing to some, and I'm not saying all CTOs are confused, but like, you know, how, what, what sort, what do they need to bring to the table to you guys to say, well, where should I put quantum? What should I, what systems should I direct to quantum compute processing to, to help out? Do you, how do you coax that out of people? Sure. Um, so again, I think the way to think about this is um, starting with the use case. So I think this, this, you know, the the, the meeting point of a company like ourselves and a, a domain expert who has a problem that they believe, you know, could be relevant to quantum, is is that's the starting point. So with a lot of companies that we're working with today, we start with the use case and say, okay what is the use case that you can see and you know what are the challenges that you have today so again to give some examples of the applications that we're talking about if you look at you know drug discovery or chemistry i mean the the, the reality of our compute systems today is we can't you know even simulate the simplest of molecules and you know one of the things that struck me um on this on my own journey in quantum is well, that's the reason why we do human trials, right? We can't actually simulate these drugs and figure out when I put this in a human body, is it going to be safe and effective? And that's why we have to put them into, uh, you know, trial them in humans. What if we could do that in a quantum computer? Um, so drug discovery, uh, I mean, we're working uh, in another, on another use case on optimization. So any sort of multivariate optimization problem with, um, today's computers very quickly runs out of steam. So if you look at, you know, financial companies on portfolio optimization, if you look at network providers, they're looking at how can we optimize the network. So if we fast forward and think about when we have autonomous taxis or autonomous planes on our network, how can we, uh, you know, the, the op network optimization becomes a much bigger problem. So I think you start with the use case and then you look at, okay, how, how does quantum intersect that, right? So I think uh, we, we'll get on to sort of quantum advantage and, and that discussion. But you look at, uh, you say, okay, how many, what resources do, you, do we think you need to actually uh, tackle that problem? And that may be, you know, maybe two years away. And so I think the journey then becomes, um, you know, putting some resources on, okay, what's available today so that I can start to dip my toe in, I can start to understand what these systems do. Because the other challenge here uh, is, I, I think, as you guys mentioned at the start, 
quantum is a very different paradigm. It's a very different way of thinking. It's a completely different software stack. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to say, uh, okay, I'll wait for two years until this quantum resource is, is ready and then, I'll, and then I'll figure it out, right? This is a, a brand new way of thinking. Um, and so I think the, the, the value proposition or, or the, the meeting place is what is the use case? When do we think quantum is going to intersect that? And let's build a roadmap to get you there so that when it arrives, you're ready for it and you're ready to take advantage. Awesome. Speaking Mark, of, uh, yeah, real no. quick. Sorry, sorry to sorry to commandeer this. I just got to get these two things out of my head real quick and then we can we can jump it. That's cool. This is a follow up to what you said, John. So or Jason, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Jason, the um, the idea of quantum being like they're atoms they're they're it's it's a chemical biological thing right so what you're saying is potentially uh quantum will be better at modeling biological and chemical things more so than traditional compute is that richard, safe to say richard richard feynman again that that's exactly what he said he said you're going to need a quantum computer to to model quantum mechanic to, to model nature because it's quantum mechanical so that's absolutely you know chemistry biology, uh, we're going to need uh, quantum to, to model that or to, to understand how that works. Awesome. And then number two, the idea of optimization, right? So I think about route optimization, right? In, in the idea of qubits being infinite states in between one and a zero, just from a layman's perspective, right? So say you have, I think I ran across, it was Michio Kaku, actually, actually I think that, that, that had this analogy. You put, uh, put a, a mouse in a maze, right? And mm -hmm. traditional compute will look at each step at a time where quantum can look at the whole realm of possibilities and model it quicker and faster. Is that right? Exactly. So essentially what happens in, if you think of the optimization problem, uh, the, it typically is modeled as a plateau and you have these, um, you know, um, areas of optimization. And, and the challenge we have in classical compute is we may find, you know, one of these uh, optimization areas, and uh, the, our classical computer thinks that that's the optimum, and it may, it may or may not be. We we can't actually tell. The the what quantum systems do well is sort of analyzing the whole plateau and making sure that you're not in a local minimum, and that's really uh, the the promise, I suppose, of quantum and optimization is that uh, because of the the quantum mechanical um, characteristics, we can model the, the entire plateau rather than just very small parts of it. Makes sense. Thank you. Well, um, I'm going to just shout out to a former book club, um, the, the Nexus by Julio Tino, where we spoke about complex systems in nature and then how tiny, tiny areas, maybe a meter squared of the ocean has this interaction of so many species where the, the classical computers can't even calculate those interactions between eight animals or mm. something. So yeah, mm. that natural aspect of it. Um, I want to get into quantum advantage, what it means, where we are, how you know, is that possible? But just because Jeremy spoke about optimization, and I want to just go back to this temperature you don't need absolute zero to be to, to these qubits so the way you explained it it was almost i understood it as kind of non-optimized qubits but they're still qubits so they're still doing what qubits do um i spoke to joe bros at ibm and i think ibm's roadmap is like a thousand qubits by 2030 but the mm -hmm. way you're doing it it seems what they're doing seems almost like redundant because what you're doing doesn't need to be perfection. So therefore you can get the efficiency of quantum computing. You can get the speed of quantum computing without this outer space I, perfection. I, I, I wouldn't say redundant. I, I guess what the way I would uh, classify it. And I think again, you guys alluded to this maybe as a, a bit of a, a point on 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 Joe's uh, discussion is, you know, quantum today is really a uh, everything to everybody, right? Uh, quantum computing today encompasses, uh, you know, anything we can't do in compute, really. And and my view would be, 
that it is going to segment and there isn't going to be one winner takes all here, right? So, you know, I think the applications that we're going after um, need certain characteristics and they are a lot of qubits and, and maybe not the, um, you know, the highest quality, but, you know, the three that we've identified, chemistry, optimization and AI really are well suited to, to the way we're doing it and the way we're proposing. There are other applications such as encryption that would, would potentially need much higher, you know, uh, quality on your single qubit because if you're doing, you know, Shor's algorithm, which is a very long calculation, you maybe need uh, less number of qubits, um, but, uh, but a longer coherence time. And so my answer there is that, you know, this isn't a winner take all. I think today it is maybe viewed from the outside as one, uh, one thing, but I think as, as we progress here, as, as we have, as you see in classical computer or classical applications, there'll be certain thing areas that will be relevant to certain air, um, at certain technologies relevant to certain applications. And, you know, the market for any one of those, I think is going to be massive. So I think there's plenty of space for multiple companies here. Important answer. Thank you. So those of you watching, uh, Jason, we've got a, actually a large amount of people watching us right now. Uh, so this quantum discussion is is definitely resonating. So those of you watching in real time, feel free to drop, drop a question for Jason in the chat. It's okay to use your silly card. Mark used his silly card. No silly questions. I've got loads. I've got loads. He's got of a bunch questions. of them if you need more. I've got more. so yeah. many stupid questions. Uh, no no, I, no silly like, questions. Like, how, let's, how, let's, how, how can a qubit not be... I guess if it's superposition, it can be anywhere at any time. So it can be any level of quality at any time. So forget it. Just like just like the film, everything, everywhere, all at once, right? Yeah, Watch that and exactly. freak, your, freak your mind out. Uh, Jason, let's talk about AI. You mentioned AI. Um, so AI is getting a lot of buzz, both good and bad, great uses, bad uses, really scary uses unimportant uses like what what can quantum mostly do? unimportant uses mostly <laughs> unimportant uses what but what can quantum do specifically what can equal one's version of quantum do to uh to support fix help ai and vice versa that relationship yes yeah absolutely uh, so let me start with the first one and and uh, so here's my perspective on that right um I think it's pretty amazing where we've got uh, in AI and, and generative AI and chat GPT and all of that, right? It's absolutely amazing. Um, but if you look at the power that we're, that it takes to train these models and you compare it to the power that our brain uh, consumes, you're talking about you know, megawatts versus our brain takes about 20 watts. And I don't think anybody would argue today that you know, these models are anywhere, you know, a fraction of, of, uh, um, of what we can do with our brains. And therefore, my, my kind of uh, view of this is that as fantastic as the progress has been, we've taken a wrong turn, right? We've, we've gone in a direction that is not optimum and is, you know, is not sustainable. And I think quantum can potentially help with that, right? I think if you look at what AI is doing, AI essentially is building, you know, neural networks that are again sort of mimicking the um, some of what's going on in the brain, but it, they're mimicking them with classical uh, circuitry. So we're sort of taking, um, you know, a, a quantum mechanical process, trying to make a classical version of that, and then scaling that uh, to, to as far as we can go. I think because quantum is, you know, probabilistic itself in nature. And again, back to the commentary around, you know, it's going to be much better at simulating uh, atoms and electrons and, and nature than, you know, the bet. And, and at this stage, it is a bet is that quantum will do AI much more efficiently. And, um, and I think what we really need to prove that, as we did in, uh, in the classical AI space, is compute big enough for people to get on and experiment. And I think you're going to see that here in the next number of years where we will make progress and we will be able to, um, you know, prove uh, that, you know, quantum AI is going to have a major effect. The second piece of the question is also really interesting because we have a, an angle on that where, you know, so it, you'll see people talk about um, 
quantum for AI and AI for quantum. And AI for quantum, again, because these qubits are extremely fragile, they're extremely challenging, we're actually using AI to control them and to detect errors. So we actually were putting an, a neural network um, on, um, on the chip to learn the errors uh, and then to correct those in real time. So yes, there's, a, there's an element of this about you know, uh, AI for quantum and an element about quantum for AI. Awesome. Makes sense. We're actually starting to get some questions rolling in uh, from from the, the the viewers. So what is a real life application of quantum computing in drug discovery? Right. So like there's a lot of chemistry that happens in drug discovery, a lot of biology that happens in drug discovery. What what, what would a real real life application of this look like? Can I just well, add I something I, to that? I, mm. I just wanted to get upstream on, on drug discovery and maybe add something to that as well is actually accurate and precise disease um actually because no disease is the same for each if you have a disease it's not the same as other other person actually defining the illness of somebody is takes years and years and years at the moment i think that quantum can also bring that down in, in at the same time as it's they're using it to discover drugs yeah i mean maybe two two angles to, the, to this question um uh, when I read it first, I sort of, uh, I thought it was about, you know, what is uh, sort of today, what is the application of quantum computing and drug discovery? And I think that's a discussion around, again, quantum advantage. So the race today in the industry that ourselves and others are, are running, uh, you know, as fast as we can is to get a, a qubit platform and a system where we can scale the qubits to get to enough qubits so that we can uh, simulate uh, these molecules, right? So, um, so you know, and, and, and that's that's in process. And you know, I think we need something in the thousand qubit range, which we're not there yet. But I think we will be as an industry, and and uh, an equal one will be there in the next you know two plus years. Um, I mean, in terms of real life application, again, it is very much about being able to simulate. Um, these molecules being able to uh, simulate the energy state of them. Uh, that's something we can't do today, even for the most simple molecules. So um, if you take paracetamol, um, you know, we actually don't know the physical mechanisms of how paracetamol works. It's, you know, we, it's just been handed down generation to generation, but there isn't a scientist uh, alive that is able to say exactly the mechanisms and that's because we, you know, we we can't simulate it. And so it's really about figuring out, I, I guess, at a base level, the energy states of these molecules uh, and how then they interact with other energy states. And um, you know, you have um, protein folding and all of these extremely complex um, structures that you know the likes of uh, DeepMind and these other companies have made massive progress on uh, with an AI approach. Quantum is really about, um, and I and I think of it sort of like that plateau analogy, right? The uh, the energy system of a molecule is extremely detailed, extremely complex, and when they interact, it's it's extreme complexity as well. And qubits do that well. Again, coming back to the analogy of they are, you know, that system is a quantum mechanical system. So our tools today are very um, uh, you know, um, high level in terms of trying to be able to predict that quantum mechanical is itself at that level. And so it will be able to predict those interactions. So hopefully that answers, answers the question. So the, yeah, so the innate structure of small molecules that are involved in creating medicine to make us better, that point to fixing something that is also small molecules in our body, we have to do that kind of compute on similar infrastructure is that safe to say uh, exactly that's exactly it yeah yeah interesting this stuff is fascinating man I, the more the more we talk about quantum the more I, the more i start you know i, I can't remember what maybe Feynman said this too or another you know quantum physicist you know if if you don't understand quantum you're on the right track kind of thing <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you think you understand quantum you're lying right that's right that's right uh, Mark, where else do you want to go with questions? Well, well, 
I, I, we always talk about no go go jason sorry, sorry. For interrupting. i mean i was going to jump in on that right i do think people shouldn't be scared of this right i i um i think if i if you look at so again my analogy to kind of the classical um uh, our classical uh, semiconductor industry right when i was in college I did electronic engineering and, you know, we had a course where we did the energy band gaps of uh, silicon and silicon germanium and gallium arsenide. Um, and, you know, I haven't used that uh, since that class, right? Um, I think we will abstract up so that people don't need to have a, a PhD or, or more in, in, in quantum physics to understand these things, right? Our, our history of of being able to progress technology my view is a history of abstracting away the complexities so that more and more people can become involved and that will happen in quantum it's happening now we're we're at the qubit level today but we're we're building those foundational blocks and again we did it in uh classical uh, uh electronics when I was in college, again, we, we talked about error correction and ECL and all these different types of error correction that were needed for transistors. That's all still in existence, but nobody worries about that because we've got it figured out. So I, I think one thing I would say is, you know, not for people to be afraid of this. You don't need to understand the, you know, uh, the full quantum mechanics. It will get abstracted up. I think it's more about understanding frameworks and maybe understanding the, the, the software stack somewhat uh, to understand uh, you know, what's coming down the line. So I was gonna ask, we, we mm. talk about, uh, on think, here on Thinking of Paper, it's all of these emerging technologies working together. And we often see kind of quantum as the puppet master pulling these, or, or in the future, pulling these other emerging technologies onwards um but i was thinking quantum computing for all the success that everyone's having the progression from the outside looks quite slow people talk about decades before you get perhaps useful quantum computing what technologies need to improve or evolve outside of quantum computing to make quantum computing more efficient, better scale, more to get more qubits. Yeah, is that, is that? Yeah, what, I, I won't even try to pretend. Sure. What are the technologies? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, look, I think um, you know, quantum has been going on for some time, right? So that's the first thing to remember. Even though it's you know fairly recently entered the public consciousness, you know, this is a 50 plus year journey and even if you go back you know to einstein and and you know it's it's even further right um so there's been a consistent progress um i would say the the rate of progress has massively increased over the last decade and and the last five years i think you're now seeing major milestones from companies in the ecosystem almost on a weekly basis and i think we're now on a, you know, on a cadence that to me says quantum is no longer decades away. You know, quantum is going to be here in the next, you know, five, uh, five, you know, ish years. Right. Um, so what do we need uh, to make that happen? So I come back to, I suppose, uh, a scalable qubit platform. So what do what do you need for qubits? You need a, um, a, a, a material system that is very pure and enables the, the qubit not to have these decoherence paths to various um, errors. Um, so we need, you know, we need material people and we need, uh, you know, a lot of it is about the interfaces. And so there's a material piece to this. Um, there is a cryogenic, uh, you know, a, a, a cryogenic industry making um, more efficient cryogenic systems um yeah and then you know i think again if i think about what it is we're doing we're gone from controlling thousands of particles to controlling a single particle right so whether it's you know our blend of qubits uses electrons um you know you have neutral atom uh, companies who are using atoms in a vacuum uh, you have photonic companies who are using photons of light but the one thing that unites us all is that 
we're no longer, uh, you know, worrying about a flow of electrons or, a, you know, thousands of these things. We're now worried about one. And that means the control systems, you know, everything needs to be orders of magnitude more accurate, lower noise, um, you know, more precise. And I think that's a massive opportunity for the electronics industry in general, right? If you look at the control of qubits, it's with classical electronics, but with classical electronics that are much more accurate and, you know, much lower noise and a, an order of magnitude, again, more difficult than what we've had up till now. I love that explanation. There are so many adjacencies that that yeah. make technology possible. And like, I think a lot of folks, you know, maybe just picturing one guy in the corner trying to get one qubit to behave or one molecule to behave. And, you know, it's, it's like, there's so many other things that have to come together in, in different ways, different molecules, different, different things. Jason, I think what you're doing is, is really awesome. I love the accessibility. I love the, the pointing back to Julio Tino and in, in one of our other books that we read, the Nexus talked about rooting new things in the way old things are done, right? It's, it's, it's a bridge to kind of build to the future. And I think it's a really smart way uh, that you're doing it. And, you know, I hope to hope to hear more and more about uh, all the great things you guys are doing. You're very well-spoken in, in making this complex technology, this complicated technology, a little bit more accessible to, to folks. So uh, thank you for that. I want to, let's, let's do the carryover question. So, mm -hmm. uh, so next week, do we have the Pillbot guys coming on next yes. week? Is that who it is? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, we, I think that's their real name, but yes. Well, that, but it, but it's, um, I think the product is called, so it's basically like a, a pill you can swallow that does a lot of GI diagnostics, uh, which is, which is really interesting. It doesn't have to be related to that, but what would you ask that, that group, uh, if you could ask any question and, and again, no silly questions, like silly sure. questions are permissible, like anything <laughs> you want to ask. I, I, well, I, you know, mine is, my question is maybe, a. uh, you know, quite a serious one, I suppose. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and discussing talent, right? And um, I think all of these uh, new technologies, whether it be quantum or, you know, um, pills, digestible pills, uh, they need talent and we need, you know, the world's best people excited uh, uh, about this and engaged. And I think we have a, a major challenge across the, the board in terms of STEM, um, with young people, um, you know, um, in in getting them in and getting them excited. And so my question would be, you know, what out of the box uh, ideas would you have for getting more young people excited about these technologies? Brilliant question. Wonderful Brilliant question. question. And I, I've got a quick answer. They could actually join our book club and, and read books Good. about this stuff. What do you think, Mark? Um, I'm not sure that maybe we need more young kids reading so yeah i'm all for it book club but um i'll be interested in um a more i, I, I don't know what the answer to that is i'll be interested to hear any ideas jeremy what would you say just Man, riffing I, on it jason great question i think it's i think it's about catalyzing curiosity in people and mm. pointing that to the trend of emerging technologies and figure out what ride you want to get on right and what you could be what you could what you could sustain your curiosity to power that ride right absolutely and and i think it's, it's for me it's about also talking you know i think um and it's you know it, it it comes out a little bit when we talk about quantum there is this kind of whoa this is you know this is something that is very different and um, so I think trying to normalize it and trying to make it, I mean, one of the things I, I have heard speculated that, you know, I think is maybe a, a, a relevant point is that maybe the challenge we have with uh, quantum algorithms today is that nobody has been educated quantum natively, right? We're all educated classically, and then we're trying to get our minds around this stuff. And maybe actually we need people who are quantum first and thinking about that, and then we'll have quantum algorithms coming out. So I think it's it's about, yes, uh, there is challenges and yes, this is difficult stuff, but also it's not insurmountable. We're going to figure it out. Uh, you know, it is going to become normal. And so, you know, don't be scared about it, I think is the other message I would give. Wonderful. Quantum first is amazing. So quantum like first. 
quantum first well uh jason lynch thanks for joining us um check out more we'll put a bunch in the show notes but equal one dot com equal the number one dot com you can check out their stuff thinking on paper dot xyz is where you can find mark and i we're on spotify we're on youtube apple wherever you listen to your podcast we've got a new book club book starting michio kaku uh he is a theoretical physicist one of the founders of string theory deep into quantum his new book quantum supremacy recently came out we're going to be reading it chapter by chapter we're going to be doing breakdowns uh so if you don't want to read the book listen to the episodes and uh hopefully spark some interesting things mark anything on your side closing yeah if you do want to read the book you have seven days to order it and join us because i think probably next friday we'll be doing the first chapter so you've got seven days to buy quantum i forgot what it's called already yeah buy the book there you have it jason thanks again for joining us uh hey disruptors and curious minds thanks, guys. be curious stay disruptive keep thinking on paper till next